to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ as we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what we've preached, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 9. We welcome you today to our study of the beautiful book of Galatians. We hope that you'll locate your Bible and have that handy as we're going to be looking today to the Word of God in our study together. We're so glad that you joined us. And friend, we'd like for you to know today that our lessons are being brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. They have worship on Sunday morning or Sunday night maybe as well, Wednesday, and they would love to have you as an honored guest. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about souls and the truth, and who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. Friend, we'd also like to help you in your journey to know God better here at the Gospel of Christ. Would you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, we have a wide variety of good Bible study materials. All of our audio and video lessons, as well as our transcripts, are available online, and it's all free of charge. Friend, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether that be a DVD or CD, we can make that available to you free of charge. Just visit our website or call us and write to us and we'll send that to you. As we think today about the book of Galatians, there are several things that we want to consider, but from the outset, let's realize Paul is writing to the church in Galatia to help them see, to get them to realize that although some people are trying to mix parts of the old law with parts of the new law, in reality, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the New Testament, is all one needs to be saved. And so it begins in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, by illustrating that there isn't a gospel plus or a gospel minus this, it is the pure gospel that'll only save. Notice in your Bible, Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel than what we've preached, let him be accursed. Friend, the message of the gospel is all that's needed to be saved. I hope you'll listen real carefully. It doesn't matter what man says. Man's opinion, man's ideas, history, uh, tradition, What's going to save people? Is it my words and my thinking or some religious leaders thinking somewhere else? No. Paul says if anybody preaches to you anything other than the pure gospel, which we find in the Bible, which Paul himself preached, let him be accursed. Friend, that is such a serious language there. It is so serious that we stay with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friend, this is why we want to follow the teaching of the New Testament. Acts chapter 6, verse 7, many of the priests were obedient to the faith. That faith is the gospel system of salvation. And so we want the Bible to be what saves us. You know, sometimes I'll see people come around with another book. And on the front of that book, it will say, another testament of Jesus Christ. Wait a minute now. What did Paul just say? In Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you into the gospel of Christ to another gospel, another... Te no, there is not another. There is the one beautiful message of the teaching of Jesus Christ. 
Friend, as you think about this verse, here's the seriousness which Paul illustrates this with. Paul says, not only us, I don't want you to think, you know, we're not going to come preach another gospel to you, and if we do, that's not right. But then he takes it so far as to say, even if an angel came and did that, don't believe them. Friend, he's not promoting the idea that an angel is going to come teach some other gospel, but just to show the, the seriousness of staying with the gospel. And so when we hear about another testament brought by some angel, which some religions might promote, friend, let's realize that's not in keeping with Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. Now someone says, okay, that's all good and well, but how serious is that? To teach us about this serious nature, Paul uses the word accursed. This is the Greek word anathema. Uh, the, the UBS translators actually uh, translate this as, may he be cursed to hell. And friend, that catches, that's very strong, I know, but it catches the idea of what's being said here. When Paul says, if anyone preaches any other gospel, let him be accursed, the idea is, may he be cut off from God and sent to hell. Now that's strong. Why would Paul say that? Well, friend, it's not because he wants people to be lost or he's trying to shock people, but rather when someone teaches another gospel, even though there's not a another, and people buy into that, do we realize those people are going to be lost? If, if I have the gospel of Christ and then somebody comes along and adds something to that that's not a part of the gospel of Christ and calls it the gospel of Christ, although it's really not, and people believe that and buy into it and obey it. How does that affect them? Well, friend, if it's not the simplicity of the true gospel, and they buy into that, and it's not from God or the Lord Jesus Christ, people are going to be lost. 28. That's why the Apostle Paul said, may he be cut off, may he become an anathema. James 3 verse 1 says, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. And, and, and the reason being is because what we say is going to affect people for eternity. Then in Galatians chapter 1, we move uh, from the idea of another gospel into chapter 2 where Paul talks about the really transition and changed life. What does it mean to, if there's not another gospel, what's it mean to really live by the teaching of the gospel? Well, friend, it is a complete, changed, and committed life. Notice Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. Here's how Paul felt. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Friend, as we think about this idea, we each need to examine our lives and make sure that we not only realize there's only one gospel, but that we're really 100% committed to that. Paul said in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul said, I'm begging you by God's mercy. Be transformed, be committed, be a, a living sacrifice for Jesus every day. Friend, being a Christian, it's not just something you do when you go to worship on Sunday or, or Wednesday or, or, or go to Bible study. Being a Christian is a, a life of change and commitment every day. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Listen to this. And you are not your own. What do you mean I'm not my own? You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are His. Friend, when I became a Christian and I came up out of the waters of baptism in obedience to the gospel, that was no longer me. That, that old man was put to death. And my life changed to live for Christ every day. Here's how Jesus would say it in Luke 9, 23. And I want you to listen to the daily aspect here. Jesus said this. What's it really mean to follow Christ? If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. 
Friend, as we then think about further teaching in the book of Galatians that's so practical, let's realize it's possible for a person to be bewitched or tricked religiously if they're not careful. Friend, I hope you'll hear me well. There are a lot of people who are trying to trick others. Maybe not necessarily uh, with impure motives, but maybe by not following the Bible. Then there are people who are in it for the wrong reasons. Money, fame, popularity, lust, whatever it may be. And the book of Galatians warns us that a person can be tricked or bewitched from obeying the truth. I want you to notice the words of Galatians 3, verse number 1. Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Some of the Galatians were being tricked because they were being taught or told that not only do you have to obey the gospel and become a Christian, but you've also got to go back and be uh, circumcised, as some are promoting in Galatians 5, verses 1 through 5. And Paul says that that's not the case. It's not Christ plus circumcision. If you believe that, you're being bewitched or tricked. And friend, there's a lot of folks today who are preaching a gospel that is not the pure gospel. People are being taught that, that we live in a very humanistic society. And although there's this form of the gospel, it's really about what makes you feel good. And humanism is such a, a part of that. Humanism basically is man is at the center, and whatever makes man happy, that's what we need to do. Friend, that's not Christianity. God and Christ are at the center in everything I do should revolve around pleasing them, worshiping them, praising them, and making them happy. Then there are some Gospels that will say that sin's okay. You can do this sin or this sin's okay as long as you get penance later or, or you can be involved in this and that's all right, whether it be morally, whether it be doctrinally. Friend, you can't have the Gospel plus sin. Paul said in Romans 6 verse 1, Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Now, friend, we're not saying someone's going to live a perfect life. We all, from time to time, sin. But I've got to do my best to repent and turn from that. I can't live in sin and, and think that's going to be okay. What about the lust of the flesh? There were some in the New Testament who were promoting uh, Christ plus lasciviousness. Galatians uh, Jude 1, verses 3 and 4. That is, it was a, a license to sin. As long as we have God's grace, you can go out and live however you want and give in to these lusts or do what... No. Friend, that's not the purity of the New Testament gospel. We're not talking about being a Christian and then going living however you want, living it up in the flesh. Now friend, there are some things that are good and right and moral, but the sins of the flesh that are mentioned in the Bible, a Christian ought to do his best to abstain from that. First Peter chapter uh, two, verse number, uh, first Peter chapter one, verse 21 and 22, we're to abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, also mentioned in first Peter chapter two, verse number 11. And then there are some doctrines that teach that it's okay if uh, you do these things or if you live this way or if you follow this teaching. There's a lot of religious error out there. For example, some doctrines will teach and people will teach that you, once you're saved, you can never be lost. Now, friend, that's just not true according to the Bible. They'll say, once you become a Christian, you can never do anything to cost you your soul. You can never so sin as to be lost. Is that really what the Bible teaches? We're going to see in the book of Galatians that that's just not the case. As we think now in Galatians chapter uh, 3 and 4, we're going to notice as well that the law had a specific purpose. And that purpose was to bring people up to Christ. I want you to look in Galatians 3 verses 10 through 13 with me for just a moment. And notice, although Paul is dealing with the old law, here's what he says about it. For as many are as of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What about these people in the book of Galatians, in the area of Galatia, who are wanting to go back and have 
Christ plus the old law. Paul says, do you really understand what you're doing? Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things written therein. What's it mean to have part of the law? A friend, the law says, if you don't continue in all of it, you're condemned by it. James 2 teaches that, Galatians 3, verses 10 through 13. Uh, it will be mentioned in Acts 15 as well. The law was designed to bring us to Christ. And, and if we don't keep the law perfectly, we failed it entirely. And now people are trying to bring part of the old law in. You see, the point is this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by having become a curse for us. You remember Deuteronomy 27, Deuteronomy 21, verse 23 as well? The old law said this. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things written therein. Okay, so nobody could keep the law perfectly. Peter said in Acts 15, verse 10, neither we nor our fathers kept it perfectly. Now, I want you to think about this. You're cursed if you don't keep the old law perfectly. The law says, Peter, an inspired apostle of God, said, nobody can keep it perfectly. Therefore, what did the law bring? A curse. What? Well, that sounds like a problem. And friend, it was a problem that Jesus is the answer to. Christ became the curse for us so that we don't have to bear the curse of the law. Remember, everyone's cursed who can't keep it perfectly. Nobody can keep it perfectly. And yet the Bible says in Deuteronomy 21 verse 23, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. Who was hanged on the tree for me and you? Well, Jesus was, right? This is the beauty and simplicity of New Testament Christianity. And this is why we don't need the old law. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself, Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. He through death overcame him at the power of death and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. The Bible says that as well in Hebrews 2 verse number 14. And so friend, what Paul is trying to help these people see is you don't need to mix Christ plus the old law. Christianity, the New Testament, what we refer to as the, the new law of Christ, it's able to save man immediately and by itself. And so we think about the beauty of this idea. And friend, I want you to see that, that idea summed up in Paul's beautiful words in Galatians 4 verse 4. Look at the beautiful picture painted here. The Bible says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Friend, when I think about the fullness of time, God's great scheme of redemption, everything was perfect. Prophetically, it was perfect. Isaiah 7 verse 14, He was going to be born of a virgin. And we learn in Matthew 1 verses 19 through 21 that Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, historically it was perfect. You've got Daniel 2 verse 44. God was going to set up His eternal kingdom during the time of one of these four kingdoms. You've got the, the Babylonians, the Greek, the Medo Persians, and the Romans. And in that Roman era, Jesus comes forth and establishes a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Romans 11 verse 14. Everything fell in place. You've got God's plan coming together so beautifully that in the fullness of time, at the right time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born of that virgin, born under the law, as one keeping the law, and yet He was born to redeem those who tried to bear the weight of the old law. Friend, I, I hope you'll understand what I'm saying here, uh, and I hope you understand the way I'm saying it. The old law was a good law. Romans 7 teaches us that. But can you imagine trying to keep that law perfectly? Think about this with me. Let's say we're living under the old law. and We're working out in the shop and we hit our nail with a hammer. Ooh, that hurts and we say something we shouldn't have said. What do you got to do if you're living under the old law? My friend, you got to make sacrifice. Meaning you might have to go out to the field and get a heifer or a bull or a lamb or two turtle doves if you couldn't afford any of that, and you'd have to kill it. You'd have to drain its blood. You'd have to skin it. You'd have to uh, do that with the priest. You'd have to, he'd have to burn it on the altar of sacrifice, and, and that would be a, an offering for our sins. And what happens if tomorrow 
you do something again. Back out to the field you trot. Now friend, the old law was meant not as the perfect answer, but as a perfect guide to bring us up to Christ, who is the once for all answer for sin. And you say, okay, that's all good and well, but what's that got to do with the book of Galatians? Friend, that's what Paul is trying to get these people to see. When you try to make it Christ plus the old law, why would you want to go back to a law that could never really save anyway? Do you remember the words of Hebrews 10 verses 3 and 4? The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Why in the world would you want to try to mix Christ, who in and of himself completely saves, Hebrews 27, uh, Hebrews 7 verse 25, with a law and a system that could never save? Paul's saying it just doesn't make sense. And friend, the good news is we're living in the age of Christianity where we don't have to worry about going back under that old system. All right, let's then open our Bible to Galatians chapter 4. And I want you to notice another beautiful teaching from this book. Notice Galatians chapter 4 verse 16. Now Paul has said some pretty difficult things, but Paul wants us to know, don't kill the messenger for the message. Look in Galatians chapter 4. Verse 16, Paul asked a very simple question. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Friend, some of these people were so caught up in Judaism that they were not going to like Paul's message at all. They needed to hear it. It was the truth, but they were going to end up getting mad at Paul as the messenger. And Paul says, am I your enemy when I tell you the truth? Friend, there's a beautiful principle taught there. Let's not focus on the messenger. Let's focus on the message. Was what was being said true? If it was, regardless of who said it, I need to obey it because it's from God. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23, verse 23. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And so uh, the messenger's responsibility is simply to preach the truth in love. But friend, if I don't like that message and it's from God, don't blame the messenger. Deal with God who gave us the message and let's make sure that we focus on that, not on people. And then as we think about Galatians 5, we mentioned just a little early in our lesson that some people like to promote the idea, and it is so popular today, that once you're saved, you can never be lost. The idea is once saved, always saved. It's known as uh, perseverance of the saints, or maybe by a more popular term, you can't fall from grace. You know what's great about the Bible? Thousands of years before men come up with ideas like can't fall from grace, God uses the exact language of false teachers to show it's not true. You say, what do you mean by that? Look in Galatians 5 verse 4. I want you to notice these words. The Bible, Paul speaking to Christians who are trying to go back to the old law, says in Galatians 5 verse 4, You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now friend, don't misunderstand that he's writing to people who are Christians who have been saved. Notice Galatians 1 verse 1 through 3. Paul is writing to the brethren. He's writing to uh, the churches of Galatia, people who are in the body of Christ. And so there were Christians in the body of Christ in Galatia who were attempting to go back to the old law. And Paul said, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, friend, I want you to listen real carefully to that statement. Some people will say you can't fall from grace, but you know what God says in the exact language? Two Christians who are trying to bring the old law back into the church, Paul said, you have fallen from grace. That word from is literally the word ek, and it means out of. Some people say, well, here's Christ, and you've just moved yourself a little. No, the Greek word literally, mean, literally means you're out of. You've become severed from Christ. You are no longer in Christ if you try to bring the old law back. And so we learn from this. It is possible for a Christian to do something such a sin that he removes himself outside of Christ and is lost. You know, the clear, one of the clearest passages on this is found in Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. Simon tried to buy the gift of God with money. Peter said, your heart's not right in the sight of God. You've got neither part nor portion in this matter. And Peter said these words, your money perish with you. 
Simon, who just became a Christian, so sinned in such a way that he was in a perishing or lost state. Just like Galatians 5 verse 4, Acts 8 verse 20 teaches, a person can so sin as to be lost. Now friend, what about those people who do sin? Christians have a great responsibility to them. Notice Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2. The Bible says this, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Friend, God doesn't want anybody to be lost. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 clearly teaches that. Christians don't want anybody to be lost either. And we have a responsibility to somebody who is in sin to help them, to encourage them, to, to, to show our love and compassion, to maybe rebuke them if they're in sin. But all of that in view of our own selves, considering the fact that there is a reality. This could happen to any of us and we love people, we love souls, and we love God enough that we don't want anybody to ever be lost. Friend, as we think about closing the book of Galatians today and its beautiful message, here's the grand idea. It's the purity and it's the simplicity of the gospel that saves. Friend, we ask you today, are you a New Testament Christian? I'm talking about just being what they were in the book of Acts, just doing what they did to be saved. Have you heard the message of Jesus Christ? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you repent and turn from sin? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? Romans 10, verse 10. And to be saved, would you be baptized? Jesus said this, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. Friend, we want you to know that we love you. We're praying for you today and we hope that you'll obey the gospel if you're not a Christian. And if you are, keep fighting the fight and one day let's enjoy heaven together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.